12, verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Welcome to By the Word of Their Testimony. And here is your host, Casey Verkerka. Hello and welcome to the program. So glad you have joined us today. And uh, today you will very much enjoy uh, the story uh, from our special guest, Rod Mauler. Thank you so much for coming in today to share your experience. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Now tell me about um, yourself and what you're doing now. Currently I'm studying theology at Avondale University, uh, studying the ministry. Okay. And you've been doing that for... A uh, little while now? Yeah, this is my fourth year, so okay, yeah, graduate so, in a few months. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah, <laughs> praise the Lord. Finally through all of that phase and moving on to the next. Studying through COVID. <laughs> yeah, that would have been, that That was a one-of-a-kind experience. 100%. <laughs> so um, obviously you're you're here uh, in Avondale area, in, in Kurunvong area, in New South Wales. Um have you always been here or where have you come from in your your life experience? Yes, yeah, so I uh, grew up in Queensland. Okay. Yeah, so um, Western Queensland. I was born in Toowoomba and then uh, mm-hmm. did my high schooling out at a place called Chinchilla. Aha, uh-huh, I've yeah. heard of that place. Oh, wow. Not many people yeah. have heard of that. Out, out whoop whoop in New yeah, Queensland, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then um, as a... A uh, young adult, I moved into Brisbane, obviously, because there was that's where the work is. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. And um, what was your what was your home life like? Yeah, so I I grew up in a Catholic background, mm-hmm. um, quite a devout um, Catholic family. Uh, mm. We went to church every every Sunday. Yes, and uh, um, we were Irish background, so okay. um, I'm the eldest of six. Wow. Um, my mum was the second eldest of nine, so uh, big family. Yes. Um, and family events always seem to revolve around uh, religious events. So, yeah, First Communion and christenings and mm. um, uh, confirmations and all those sort of things because you had lots of cousins, So mm-hmm. and then there's Christmas and Easter. So yes. Um, our religious experience was heavily interwoven into our Way of our life. family and culture and, yeah. and, and how we all got together as cousins and family. Mm, yeah. mm, interesting. How did you find that environment for you uh, spiritually? Did you form a, a connection with God through that time yourself that was meaningful to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, from a very young age, I really took to, to religion. It was my favorite class at school. I Is went to a right? Catholic school and... Mm-hmm. Uh, I really loved religious studies. I did better at that than all the other other subjects. Mm. And uh, uh, as a teenager, I was a, a youth leader. Um, there's a youth movement within the Catholic Church called Antioch. Okay. And yeah, I was uh, a youth leader in that. And um, I really, yeah, resonated with with my faith. Mm. Mm. And so obviously that that. Is an interest is still continuing. You know, you've yep. been studying that um, in recent times as well. But um, is did you remain in that Catholic faith community? You know, you mentioned about how you had a str- a strong relationship with God during that time. Did that change over the years? Like, what happened through your yeah. early adult life? Yeah. So um, when I moved to Brisbane, I I guess the the network that I'd been involved with in terms of my, my faith. Growing up, I'd moved away from and, and moved into the bigger city, and I found it a, a bit hard to reconnect. Mm. Um, and there was other distractions, obviously, as well, being um, 18 and 19 years old. And, yes. And so I, I did drift a little bit, but I still retained my um, my sense of purpose and my, my sense of who I was in terms of my religious beliefs. Mm. And I guess it all changed for me when I met a girl. Hmm. And uh, that usually changes that, a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> and it just so happened that she was um, Seventh Day Adventist, and oh. um, and so we started dating, and and we'd been dating for about uh, three weeks. So hmm. the relationship was was very new, hmm. and I took her out for for lunch, and. I was quite a serious guy, and mm. so I sat her down and I said to her, now, if we're ever to get married, 
you have to become Catholic mm. and we have to send our children to a Catholic school. Mm. That was quite <laughs> something to say to a Seventh-day Adventist girl. <laughs> and uh, she was quite smart with the way that she, she dealt with that. Okay. Uh, she's now a lawyer, which doesn't shouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Um, but uh, she said to me, do you believe in the Bible? And I said, yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Uh, she said, um, do you believe it's the word of God? I said, yeah, absolutely. She said, well, if you can convince me according to the Bible that Catholicism is correct, then I'll convert. And in my mind, I thought, hey, you'll be Catholic by the end of the week. There you go. Yeah. But to give you some context into, yeah. into you know, the background of why I, mm. you know, had that sort of mentality, I guess, is um, my grandmother, for example, was a, a twin Okay. She was a twin, and so her twin sister, and as twins growing up, they were very close and always got on. Mm. But the twin sister, my great aunt, mm. um, married a, uh, non, a non-Catholic. Mm. And my grandmother never spoke to her twin sister again until the day she died. Is that so? Um, was severed from the family. And so coming into this, into this relationship, I was bringing that experience mm. into that, that, you know, no, I can't marry someone who's, who's not Catholic. Right. So in your mind, you were thinking, you're, you like this girl, but the only way for this to work is if she comes to become a, a Catholic because you don't want that same thing happening where there's, there's this division in the family over, you know, you marrying someone who's not of the same faith. And, and, you know, it's a large Irish fa- Catholic family, mm. and I'm the firstborn of all of my cousins. So you so, set the benchmark. Yeah. So, <laughs> role and, model. You know, I was close to my grandparents, and so, yeah, there was all that, you know, pressure there. From, yeah, family honour in the midst of it all, as mm. well as, you know, loyalty to your faith. And That's all of right. This. Yeah, I can certainly appreciate you. you would sense that very strongly. Yeah. And then I guess the first thing that, surprised me, I guess, in the fact that um, led me on this journey was the fact that when I looked at the Ten Commandments, Mm. it was the Ninth and Tenth Commandment that really uh, got me searching because I believed that, you know, the Ninth Commandment was thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife and Mm -hmm. the the Tenth was thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's goods. Mm. And it surprised me to learn that that was actually one commandment. Yes. And that it had been split into two and number um, uh-huh, two, uh-huh. two had been taken out about idol worship. Yes, yes. And that st- set me on the path to discover, you know, what else had, had been changed, changed and um, misinterpreted. And it was quite a shaky time for me because I'd grown up believing that my – you know, spiritual house, my faith house had been built on a very solid mm. foundation. And I started to see that foundation crumble. And uh, everything that I had grown up believing and knowing, I had to re-question and, and reanalyze. And so uh, I was just so hungry for truth. Yes. I was doing uh, two to three Bible studies per week with different Adventist pastors because you know, this pastor would say, oh, I've only got time for one session, but if you want more, then I can connect you with another part. And so okay. I was doing, you know, I was just absorbing. I was reading as much material as I could get. I'd go home from work. I'd watch DVDs. Wow. Well, back then it was VHS videos. Yes, but, yes. you know, <laughs> I was just... You were really searching. I was craving, craving to know the truth because I don't know if you've been through an experience where... You believed that what you knew was absolute, mm. and then when you find out that it's not, <laughs> that's very unsettling. You you have to relearn everything that yeah. you thought that you already knew, and so yeah, it was a very um, interesting journey to go on. Mm. And during that that period of time, I really felt that my focus was upward, was heavenward. Mm-hmm. Um, I was pleading for God to to reveal truth to me, and and He was giving me light as He knew that I could handle it. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the 
beautiful ways that he worked in my life was uh, around the Sabbath. Okay. So mm-hmm. uh, I used to work in, in retail, in electrical mm. retail. Mm-hmm. And Saturday was our busiest day. And I was, you know, in a tussle to try and, you know, how do I not work the Sabbath? And so I applied for some jobs. Now, at this particular time, unemployment was up at around 10 11%. Mm. And so there was fierce competition for jobs. And so I applied for this job at Commonwealth Bank as a, as a loans manager. So it wasn't an entry-level position. It was middle management, uh, a middle management role. And I didn't have a, a university degree, no experience in finance, Wow. But it was a five-day-a-week job. And so I put in an application, and there was well over a 1,000 applicants for this job. Uh, and I thought, ah, oh, you know, I'm not even going to be considered. But anyway, I put in an application. And anyway, I got called in for an interview, and then another interview, and then another interview, four interviews. And I'm like, how is this even possible, you know? And so I, I got shortlisted down to to the top three candidates. Really? Wow. You know, we're in the interview and uh, the two senior managers are sitting there and I'm sitting on this small chair and uh, they went through the interview process. I remember they said to me, what's your greatest weakness? And I just said straight off the cuff. I said, oh, it's paperwork. And they just looked at each other and said, you realise you're going for a bank job? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then an interesting thing started to happen is they started to to justify things. Oh, you know, computers are really, you know, starting to come to the fore now. And so paperwork's not going to be as much of an issue. So they started to justify the job. And I got the position. And my best mate at that time had studied economics at Deakin University. And he was applying for those kinds of jobs and he couldn't get it. And is he, that right? And he was, you know, very jealous and quite frustrated that I've got none of that background. And, and, I and you were picked. And I was picked. And I, I said, it was all God. God wanted to show me mm. how important the Sabbath is for him. Wow. And so I believe that when, you know, when you're going through that journey and God wants to, to reveal to you the truth in his word, mm. uh, he can work amazing things in your life to be able to to allow that to happen. Yeah, um, that's true. And isn't it incredible that, you know, he's he's working through these bank bank management <laughs> <That's> employers right. <laughs> to bring you to the place just so God can show you this thing. I mean, isn't that such a testimony to the power of God and in he, what he can do? And if he opens a door, mm. there's nothing that you can do to close it. You yeah. know? And there's nothing anyone else can do to close it. Mm. And so... Um, yeah. So you took the job? Yeah, obviously I took the job. <laughs> <laughs> and you, so you were working in the bank then for a while? Yeah, um, I worked in the bank for a little while. But, you know, the most important thing about that was just the fact that it was, you know, a stage in my in my spiritual journey that God was revealing to me how important truth. his truth is to him. Mm. And, and it was a step-by-step process, you know. He didn't just bombard me with all the truth in mm. one hit because it was too much. Yeah. You know, it was a process, a process of going through that. Mm. I made a mistake in my journey though and, and I, you know, I've taken, you know, full responsibility for this mistake and that was the fact that um, after about three years of, of my journey, I, I took my focus off God and I, and I saw the congregation. Mm. And... There were some unsavory things happening at church, um, and there was some, you know, at that stage, I, you know, God hadn't opened up the health message yet to me, and so there was, you know, I was still eating some products that, you know, were not in in, in line with our with our message yet. Yes. But God hadn't, you know, hadn't taken me to that point yet. Yeah. Um, so just to clarify. When you're saying church, are you now in the Adventist, Adventist yes. church? Yes, I was worshipping every Sabbath. Okay, so you've moved away now yeah. from the Catholic church. And yeah, you've absolutely. you gained this understanding of new church. So truths. I'd been attending mm. the Sabbath church for about, yeah, about two and a half to three years. Okay. And mm-hmm. so God had just been leading me along this, this journey and, and I was, you know, constantly studying. Yeah. And my life had been, was completely different at that point than what it was when I when I came in, you know, and so... 
you know, I went. I remember I went to a a uh, restaurant one night, and there was a few people from church there, but they they hadn't seen me, and I saw them eating <laughs> the same products that I I was. You know, other they were telling me that I shouldn't be eating, and so. Um, but there was a lot of other issues as well happening within the church. But I, I guess that was sort of like one of the ca- straws that broke the mm. camel's back. And I said, uh, this church, they have the truth, but they don't have the love of Christ. Oh. And so I walked away. I made the mistake of walking away from, from the Adventist church. And um, I still believed that, you know, what I'd learned was, was truth. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to find a church that you lived, know, it. lived that truth. And so I left. I got into business. I got into politics and uh, had had a successful business. And um, life was going along and I got into the corporate world. And I had a good friend. And, you know, I, was, I guess I was in the wilderness for about seven or eight years. And mm-hmm. I had this good friend who was a musician. Mm. Very good musician, and uh, but at that stage, you know, she had uh, black hair with a red streak through her hair. Played in the pubs, you know, and so we'd hang out. And um, one day, I was having um, a coffee with her younger sister, mm. and uh, just at the, a coffee shop that she was running. And th- they'd closed, you know, it was after closing time, and we were just cleaning up, or whatever. And this guy walks in off the street. Um, offering to do tarot card readings, uh-huh. and this girl said to her, said to this guy, "Nah, sorry, not interested." And and he left. And I said to her, "I said, oh, why didn't you get your cards read? You know, maybe you can find out about what's going to happen in your future." And she said, she, curiously, she said to me, "She said, oh, no, it's against my belief." Now she could have said, "No, nah, I'm not interested," or "No, nah, I don't want to do that." But she said it's against my belief, and it just straight away triggered something. I mean, I said, Why? what do you mean against your belief? Yes. She goes, yeah, no, it's just against my belief. I said, what do you mean against your belief? That For me, it just, you know, like, no, what is this? And she said, well, actually, I'm Seventh-day Adventist. So I almost <laughs> fell on the floor. <laughs> what? <laughs> you came across <laughs> them again. <laughs> and I said to her, I said, so you're telling me um, – your sister is also Adventist? And she said, yeah. Actually, we've just started going back to church. You should join us. I went, Oof. no chance. Anyway, I really praise the Lord that they, you know, they didn't pester me, but, you know, we were mm. good friends. And so every now and again, they just say, hey, you should come. And, yeah. You know, just kept that gently. door open. Yeah, mm. gently, but just kept that door open, you know. Nice. Five months passed, and, you know, this is a... A message to all of those who have friends out there who aren't Adventist, who, you know, you've been prodding and to come. Don't give up. Um, Patience. Five months passed, and I was working in the corporate world at that stage um, at Fuji Xerox. And, you know, so I was sort of around a lot of guys that had, you know, a lifestyle that many people look up to Mm. and desire and are chasing but something was missing. Mm. I felt this hole in my heart that, you know, the things in the world just were not were not filling. And so I messaged my friend. I said to her, hey, next, next Sabbath I'll come to church with you. And this was on a Sunday. And she said, oh, great. Okay, great. And, um, you know, so we made arrangements and, mm. and I was going to meet her there. So the week sort of just came along and um, at that stage I was living in inner city Brisbane. I had a place where I had excess rooms so I let out the rooms to international students Um, and a friend of mine that week had asked if he could borrow my car because I lived in a city so I didn't really use it too much and so I'd given my friend my car. Um, We had a going away party on the Friday night for one of our students who was going back to their home country Mm -hmm. on the Monday. Mm. And so Saturday morning come after the Sunday, I really didn't give give it any more thought, you you know, about Saturday. And I woke up. about it. Yeah. I woke up Saturday morning and the Holy Spirit reminded me, hey, (laughs) don't forget you're coming to church today. 
and I woke up and I was hungover. Oh, wow. And no car. Yeah. It's raining. I looked at my phone and I had a text message from my friend to say that uh, she wouldn't be able to go to that church today, that um, she had to go to her mother's church, which was 40 minutes away, drive. So that was off, out of the question. So my friend wasn't even going to the church. <laughs> where I was supposed- and the Holy Spirit said, no, you've got to go. Wow. And, um, I'm like, that would have been a struggle. It was, it began this battle in my mind, and I'm arguing with the Holy Spirit saying, No, I don't want to go. I'm hungover. And the Holy Spirit would say, Go and have a shower. I've got nothing to wear. Just wear jeans and a t shirt. You know, um, I don't have a car. Take the train. It's raining. Take an umbrella. You know, like every objection that I gave to the Holy Spirit, man, (laughs) he just kept giving me a, you know, a response. And, so reluctantly, I got up, I got changed, I shower and picked up my umbrella. I'm walking down to the train station and I must have seemed like some crazy guy walking down the street because in my mind, I've got this conversation, you know, this dialogue happening, you know, I'm resisting, I'm resisting. I don't, I don't want to go because of all of these circumstances. Mm. And, um, well, the Holy Spirit says, you know, keep prompting me, keep prompting me, and I'm on the train. I get on the train. I'm like, oh, I don't want to be here. I should. This is crazy. I just, I should just go back home. Now, the church that I was going to was Brisbane Central Church, and um, close to that church are a number of backpackers hostels. Mm. And anyway, I'm I'm walking along, and I'm I'm still not over the line yet. You know, I'm still. Resisting, I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward, but you know, there's this struggle happening within me. Now, I'm on one side of the street, and the church is on the other side of the street, and I'm, so I'm probably still about forty meters, forty or fifty meters away from the entrance, you know, from the gate to the church, across a street, down another footpath, and I'm wearing jeans and a t-shirt and sneakers. Don't look like I'm heading to church. And this lady walks down. She walks from the church. She crosses the street. She walks down the footpath, comes up to me, stretches out her hand. And what do you think she says? Something about welcome to church or come to church or something. She says, welcome to church. Welcome to church. And she's out on the street. She's, you know... Wow. And I, I'm not, you know, I do not resemble anybody who's about to attend a yeah. church service. Um, later she revealed to me that the Holy Spirit had prompted her to go down and wow. and do that. And, and that got me across the line. Oh. That was the moment that got me across the line to at least come in. Mm. Because I, I didn't know anybody. Yeah. My, my, my friend who was, or was supposed to be meeting there wasn't going to be there. And so, I, you know... Um, that was the the you know the deciding moment that really got me across the line, and so the Holy Spirit just kept working every step of the way. So I came in and I started feeling a little bit more comfortable, mm. but I was still um, you know struggling, you know, and I'm sitting there by myself. I don't know anybody. I'm just sitting in one of the back pews, and there happened to be one pastor that I'd had a lot of respect for and in my first experience with the church and he was retired at that time and so this is a little bit further down the track now and he's Mm. and this was Mother's Day's weekend Mm -hmm. and he came in as the the visiting pastor the regular pastor was handling two churches and so the other pastor was somewhere else and this guy had been invited to be the the pastor and I'm like Wow, okay, that's interesting because, you know, if any pastor that could have been preaching that particular Sunday when I was going to attend church, it had to be this Sabbath. one pastor who I mm. had a lot of respect for. It was Sabbath, right? It's, of Sabbath, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And so he comes up and uh, he's, he begins his sermon and he said, um, I know that today is Mother's Day, mm. um, Mother's Day weekend, and Typically, the message would be revolved around, you know, 
uh, women in the Bible or you know the role of women's ministry or uh, the importance of that. But the Holy Spirit actually spoke to me, on, and he was very specific. He said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me this Wednesday and instructed me to speak something very different. Hmm. Everyone's ears are pricked, obviously, yes, especially mine. I'm like, what's going on Why? here? <laughs> and, uh, you know, he gets, he goes, firstly, on behalf of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I'd like to apologize for everything that we've ever done to cause anybody to leave our church. Wow. <laughs> Immediately I felt a weight lift off my off my chest. It was, um, yeah, brought me to tears right then and there. But it was, you know, um, God knew what I needed to hear. Mm. And uh, he said, we need to remember that we are fishers of men. We are not cleaners of men. It's our job to introduce people to Christ. It's not our job to change them or clean them. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. And it just spoke volumes to me. Six weeks later, I got baptized. Wow. Praise God. Hey. Mm. He, oh, isn't that so amazing how like that sermon was right <laughs> for you? That was a message to bring you back. As soon as I'd made that commitment on the Sunday to come, the Holy Spirit put in motion a whole sequence of events that would... Wow. To draw you back. Mm. Yeah, that's that's powerful, isn't it? What God did just when, when you'd made that decision, you set your will on his yeah. side. He's like, okay, we can work together now. Yes. Let's do this. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, when I got baptized, my... Um, my key text was Matthew six thirty three because um, I'd been doing things my way. I wanted to set up, you know, in my mind, I wanted to set up a, a kingdom here on earth, and then mm. later on, I would, I would give my life to Christ. But mm. you know, it says in that text that you know, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and everything else will be then added to you. Yeah, wow. Because your situation, like from you know, outside of church, your everyday life situation, I imagine would have been fairly reasonably successful yes, yeah. in that space. You know, you've had all you needed. You just had the I emptiness had, inside. I had good network of people that I knew yeah. and, you know, like, yeah, I was I was on – I was very ambitious and I was heading towards a particular place. But. Yeah. And then God spoke to you in the midst of that mm. and that text represents the refocusing that happened in your mind. I had the cart before the horse. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. So that that's like this is a pivotal part of your your change in direction, your your journey. You're you're growing back in that um, space. So, like, where did that lead to next? So, you know, the the challenging thing was that um, I had no friends or network in the church mm. um, in terms of you know. Uh, a broader community. I had one, you know, friend, but mm. um, there was a strong pull from my, you know, social network and my business network outside of the church as well. And um, that was a lifestyle that God was calling me to leave. And so um, there was some incredible tension there. Yeah. You know, I had very little influence from the church side of things, but you know, really strong influence from outside of the church. That so was a big call for you then. Yeah. To step away from that. Well, and, it, you know, so God, well, there was an opportunity to go and listen to a, um, a uh, an American evangelist who came to Australia and some of the church members invited me to go. And so that was in Kingscliff. Mm -hmm. And so I went. And this was six weeks after I'd been baptized. And at that series, I felt the call to um, to do two years of mission service. Mm -hmm. um, I felt God placed that burden in my heart because that was an opportunity where he could take me out of the p situation that I was in and place me into a, an environment where I was surrounded by you know, Adventists, and I was able to continue that journey of faith uh -huh. and learn to rely on him. Yes. And so, um, yeah, I decided 
to listen to that call and to to heed that call because when I got baptized, I said, Lord, I've been doing everything my way for the last, you know, 15, 20 years. I said, Lord, you take control. Hmm. Wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, I'm... You know, You're going to go. Just send me. Just do what you will. <laughs> Surrendered. Yeah, you surrendered gave it my, all to God. I gave it all to God. Uh-huh. I said. And, you know, interestingly, um, I used to suffer migraines because I'm someone who, you know, really uh, liked to take control. And so I had an, amen- an, an immense amount of stress. Mm. It was after my baptism when I just surrendered everything into God's hands. Since my baptism, I've never again suffered another migraine. Is that so? Yeah. That's incredible. And so uh, initially I thought that I got to choose where I wanted to be a missionary. I thought, okay, you know. <laughs> I've, and the person who was speaking had been working in South America. I thought, oh, yeah, I've got friends who are South American. I, You know, I, I think that's a, a really nice place to go. And, you know, the culture is very interesting. And so in my mind I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go to South America. And I reached out to that that evangelist, and you know, made some communication, and then the global financial collapse hit. Uh huh. That was two thousand eight. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And mm. uh, all the doors into S- South America just sort of started to close. Wow. And mm. and I started to question, you know, God, I thought you wanted me to to be to do this, to be yeah. a missionary, yeah. and I um. Received the confirmation that, yes, he wants me to be a missionary, but I don't get to choose the location. <laughs> You're still on some of those leftovers <laughs> of that mindset of being That's in control right. is still That's hanging right. on. That's right. <laughs> so um, God opened up an opportunity for me to go to Indonesia. Ah, oh, very different place to South America. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 our closest neighbor. but mm. um, And I had previously traveled traveled the world. Mm. I'd been through Europe and America and different parts of Asia. Indonesia was one country that was not on my radar okay. at all. Um, <laughs> and I guess that was heavily influenced by, you know, what I'd seen in media. Uh, you know, my concept of Indonesia was this radically Muslim country because this was just after the Bali bombings and mm. then, you know, the terrible tsunami. And, yes. Um, and I... I didn't know anybody who was Indonesian and I had no contacts there. And so it was like this one country in the world that was literally a black hole for me. (laughs) Um, A good friend of mine was the director of investment for investment into Australia. And he was, he'd been based in the New York consulate. And so uh, he had a very broad network. And even him, I said to him, do you know anybody in Indonesia? And he said, no, I don't know anyone. And and so it was just this place that, you know, I hadn't considered it wasn't on my radar and I and I had no earthly supports that, could, no, that I could draw from yeah, there. Yeah, no connections. The perfect place for God. Yeah, <laughs> total, you had to totally rely on God for this one. And so I thought, oh, let me ask my mum because my mum's still Catholic and mm-hmm. – you know, I said, and she didn't attend my my baptism. So you know, mm. so I said to her, "Mum, what do you think about this? If I go to Indonesia as a missionary, and I was expecting to, you know, to get a negative." She said, oh, "I think that would be great for you. That that sounds really." I'm like, "Okay, I didn't expect that." <laughs> every every obstacle I tried to throw in front of God, he God, just he put, smashed it. Yeah, you know? <laughs> with something you didn't expect. <laughs> Totally the opposite to what and, I thought. And in, and everything that I thought would be a closed door or, you know, mm. red light, it became an open door and a wow. green light. And so it was. he made it abundantly clear that that was where he wanted me to be. Yeah. And it was such a blessing. You hmm. know. Um, Indonesia was just amazing. Uh, I met my wife there as well. Oh, and wow. um, Yeah, it was uh, incredible. Mm. There were certainly some challenges and that um, – you know, especially the first 12 months uh, to 18 months, I had been used to a particular lifestyle in, in Australia um, and now I was uh, cut off from, you know, this was pr- prior FaceTime or anything yeah, like yeah. that. So there was no, you know, immediate contact 
back with Australia. If I wanted to call, I had to get one of those phone cards and rub off the number on the back. And <laughs> and I had no money, you know, so but that was expensive. And so yeah. I was, I didn't know the language. And so it really allowed me a chance to spend time with God. Mm. And I read through the whole um, Conflict of the Ages series um, and other materials. And it just gave me a chance to really put all my dependence on God. Mm. Um, it was definitely challenging. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I um, struggled at times. You know, what am I doing here? I should just go back <laughs> home, you know. Yes. Um, but, you know, praise the Lord. He got me through. And mm. um, I'm definitely richer for that experience. Yeah, yeah. Initially, I'd planned only to go for two years. But at the end of my time doing the mission service, mm. I ended up getting into business and okay. remaining in Indonesia for 10 years. So, wow, yeah, that was... Two turned into 10. Quite an amazing mm. change. We, um, we were part of planting two churches mm-hmm. in Jakarta, so we were heavily involved in ministry there. Mm. Uh, it's a very different place to do ministry, being a, a majority Muslim country. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Proselytization is uh, illegal. Mm. Um, you can't openly, you know, promote Christianity or or the Bible. Okay. So the way that you go about evangelism there is very, very different. different. Yeah. Um, but it was such a rewarding experience, yeah. Yeah, and I guess through all of this time, God was really working to um, enrich and establish a strong foundation for your faith. A hundred percent. Now, um, yeah. because obviously... Um, you didn't have many distractions, did you, from you, you know the, your former connections in in well, your life? Yeah, and and you know one of the big things that I noticed was that um, you know once I once I started up business in Indonesia, mm. I wanted to do it God's way. Mm. So I'd done business my way, and now I said, Lord, you know, you take the reins. This is your business. This is for your glory. You know, you you lead the way, and so yeah, he he blessed us tremendously, and uh, it was a, a wonderful experience. Um, it was, you know, we had challenges, of course, yeah. but uh, you can just see God's hand moving all the way. Yeah, yeah, and you were able to do business without having the the extra pressure of migraines. That's right, exactly. <laughs> you could handle yeah, the stresses yeah. without having that heavy weight on yeah. you because you know you're in it with God. You know, That's he's right. he's carrying the brunt of it, and you're just trusting his That's right. his care, his providence, his leading. That's right. In all of that, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it, to it have is. God right in the midst of your everyday practical life experience Definitely. and that you know he, you're working together with him, even in something that's, that's just business. Yes. Um, that's a very powerful thing. Yeah, so, you know, we planted a, a couple of churches there. We we um, were very heavily involved in the ministry and um, our life revolved around church there. Mm. And uh, we'd started a family. We had a daughter. Okay, um, beautiful. And... You know, it's it's interesting. You know, when you when you give your life to God, sometimes the the calls that He places on your heart they don't make sense. <laughs> yes. You know, in human th- thinking, you know, you're thinking that you know uh, this is the best direction for me. Mm, but mm. but God sometimes other has other plans. Mm. He did that with me for Indonesia, and then. In December 2018, and, you know, things were, you know, we were quite established. Mm-hmm. Um, as I mentioned, we'd had a daughter. She, yeah. And she was, at that stage, she was um, three, going on four in, you know, in early 2019. Um, and the minist- this church that we started was only one year old, but it had grown from just a core group of six to we had over 100 people regularly mm. coming. We were baptizing Praise every month. God. Wow. Uh, we had a very strong um, supporting ministry that was, you know, we did um, depression counseling. And oh, good. In Indonesia, 65, 65% of the population are smokers. Wow. Yeah, so we ran um, the Adventist five-day quit, quit smoking, smoking programs, programs yeah, as well. Fantastic. And uh, um, from that, we, you know, we met people's needs um, created those relationships 
and then they wanted the mm. desire to know what was driving us. Mm. And so that was how we were able to reach out wow. to... So in that community, using this method of health was the best way to draw That's people right. into an understanding of the truth. That's interesting. Well, it's with the entering wedge That's right. concept, which we are familiar with. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Ellen White says, you know, Christ method mm. alone is yeah. the one that works. Jesus used that way. And mm. so when we meet people at, with their needs um, and address their physical needs, their, mm. their temporal needs, then, you know, they're able to find out more and, you know, oh, so what's driving, you know? Yeah, why are you doing this? <laughs> yeah, because we, we couldn't, you know, it was illegal for us to, to, to be the ones to introduce the Bible to them. But if they asked us, then it's open. we're open, we're allowed to share. And so by creating those relationships and meeting people where their needs are, then they had that desire to want to know. And, and mm. from that, we were baptizing every month hmm. and the, the church was growing rapidly and you know I felt that you know, this is where God wants me to be you know mm. and and then December 2018 God puts this burden in my heart to um, at that stage I was very involved in the background and that's where I like I don't particularly like being front and center I like mm-hmm. to be in the background you know making everything happen making behind everything the happen <laughs> behind the scenes and uh God put this burden in my heart to to share, to mm. you know, to share my testimony or to to preach, and and I'm like, I feel uncomfortable with this. And over there, there's a a group that do a um, a program. It's quite similar to I think um, here we have Arise, mm-hmm. and over there they have one called Yesaya. Okay. Yeah, and I, and they're very similar right. type of programs. Discipleship training sort yeah, of exactly. enrichment program. Exactly, mm. yep. And um, so they, you know, did a lot of uh, theological training and, mm. um, you know, preaching. and. Yes. So I I spoke to my um, my friend uh, who was the, our pastor at the church and I said, oh, what do you think? You know, God's placed this burden in my heart. I don't know what to do with it. Um, I'd been thinking this might be where he's asking me to go, but straight off the cuff, he goes, just go to Avondale. I went, what? (laughs) 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 Um, You know, the only thing that I had that was, you know, denoting me as an Australian was my passport. I'd I'd left Australia, you know. I had no bank accounts. I had no driver's license, no... Medicare, nothing, you know, just my passport. And so we, you know, wasn't on my radar to move back to Australia at that, yeah. at that time. And we were so invested in this ministry, you know, and which was growing so fast. But he was very sure. And I'm like, are you sure? He goes, yep. If God's put that burden in your heart, just go to Avondale. And he'd, he'd never been to Australia. Wow. And so... We prayed about it, and I said to God, you know, God, I committed when I got baptized that I would give my life to you mm. and I would follow wherever you lead. Um, and I know you've put this burden in my heart. Um, I'm happy to follow. Just, you know, you lead the way. You know, this isn't from me. If you want this to happen, you make it happen, you know. Mm-hmm. Be careful what you pray for. Yes. Um, <laughs> so that week... Uh, after I'd prayed that, uh, we'd had a um, a large client. Um, I think you have Guardian Pharmacy here. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that was one of my clients over there. And mm-hmm. we'd had them for three and a half years. And uh, we did corporate training. And um, that week, I prayed that that week, the CEO rings me and says, hey, Rod, um, we want to move in a different direction with t- in terms of our training. And um, I, I'd drawn a red line in the sand with, you know, because face-to-face training was something that I believed was the one that produced the best results and mm. I didn't want to go with uh, virtual. virtual training. Mm-hmm. But they wanted to experiment and go with virtual training. I said, I can't deliver the outcomes that I want with virtual training. Mm. And so... They moved in a different direction. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, wow. Um, and so 
but God kept, continued to provide. But he made he closed certain doors just to send a signal that this is where I want you to go. Time for a change. And so, part of my prayer was also that um, if I was going, that my wife had to be just as con- convicted because she'd never actually lived outside of Indonesia. Uh-huh. Uh, she had a corporate job as well, and um, she was, you know, on a track to be promoted, and uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, and so she, had, for us to move to Australia, she had to walk away from all of that as mm-hmm. well. Um, and we had a a young daughter, who, you know. So it had to be a calling was, for both of you, didn't right. it? Really? That's right. You know, mm. it couldn't be a half half. Exactly. You know, mm. and so I said, you know, my wife needs to be a hundred percent convicted of this as well, and so. Mm. It was just amazing to see how God moved in her life mm. to place that conviction in her heart as well because it didn't come straight away. Um, certain things ha- had to happen in her life for her to, to have that conviction as well. Yeah, wow. So let's just hold the story there. It's like on the brink of another new change yeah. um, to bring it to you know where you are today. We're just going to pause for a little break so that we can uh, let our listeners know how you can contact us if you have any questions or want to know more details about the program. Please contact us at the following uh, details. Thank you for joining us on By the Word of Their Testimony. If you would like more information about today's program or if you have any questions, please contact 3ABN Australia Radio by phoning 024973. 3456 or you can send an email to radio at 3abnaustralia.org.au You can also contact us on our 3ABN Australia Radio Facebook page. We look forward to hearing from you. Welcome back to By the Word of Their Testimony. I'm your host, Casey Fakirka, and you've been listening to Rod Mauler share his story with us today. We're so glad you've been able to join us um, today, Rod. And uh, he's been sharing about uh, how he was brought up in Queensland um, in a Catholic sort of environment and then went through quite a... Uh, quite a journey, a long journey of learning new truths and God was really drawing at his heart to uh, come to a place where he, well, you, you became an a Adventist, um, gave your heart to God and then it's been a real journey of surrender, letting God take control, letting God lead you and he's taking you through some very interesting uh, directions that you weren't even expecting, you know, quite off your radar, you're in Indonesia ended up being there for 10 years and now you've had another call come almost out of the blue like you didn't see Mm. it coming uh, to go to Avondale back to Australia a country you thought you'd left (laughs) Mm. left for good Um, but to come back here to gain obviously some more training um, for ministry Mm. and so tell me a little bit about how this transpired you were saying it needed to be a calling for yourself and your wife and that was a journey how did that play out for you? Yeah, I mean, I I think for me it was it was crucial that uh, as a family together we mm. you know we we journey together, and so uh, I didn't want to come here and study by myself and leave her there or anything yeah. like that. And so and she obviously also wanted to be with me as well. And so you know we 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 prayed about that, and and again God just worked amazing uh, things in her life. Um, personally to be able to convict her mm. that um, she's also a part of this calling and that God wants her to be here as well. And uh, So we moved here in September uh, 2019. Okay. And some of my friends back in Indonesia were like, what are you doing? You know, like, you're crazy. You've got everything happening here. You yes. know? Why, why are you moving now? And then you go, you don't have anything lined up, no jobs, nothing. You have to start, you know, from scratch. Scratch again in a new community. Yeah, place. and literally, you know, set yourself back up again, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and I just said, you know, this is where God is calling. And so... Mm. Um, Six months later, when COVID hit, the same friends were going, do you have a crystal ball? Did you know this was coming? (laughs) (laughs) God got you over here in the nick of time, didn't he? Otherwise, you would have been stuck for a few years. Well, and this is the thing, you know, if if we had have just been a little bit disobedient in the fact that we had delayed, you know, and said, Lord, we'll answer your call, but 
just give us another six months or or maybe if I had said, okay, I'll go first and then my wife will join me in six months' time, the borders would have been closed and yeah. um, I would have been separated from my wife for who knows how long, you know, and wow. so... It reminds me of a statement, success, uh, about success. Um, God gives opportunities, but success depends on the use made of them. And yes. God gave you this window of opportunity, and um, praise God you moved right through it. Yeah, and, uh, you know, when God places things in our heart, it, it oftentimes it ma- makes no sense to us in our human mm. perspectives because it runs counter-narrative to what the world expects or even to what we think is the right path. But God has a path for each and every one of us. Mm. And so heeding that call is always a blessing. Yes. Um, and, you know, when we moved, obviously there was challenges. Uh, it took time to to reassimilate and to, mm-hmm. to get established and settled. And, you know, we're trying to do that all at the same time with no jobs and trying to figure out how we're going to get some money in. And, yes. Uh, it was an incredibly stressful time. But but God was there the whole stretch. Yeah. But, you know, he kept providing blessings and... You know, it was just amazing the way that God worked. And so, you know, we we find ourselves now, you know, four years down the track and, and we're ready to start a, a new mm. adventure again again soon. And so what I've one of the things that I've learned um in our journey mm. is that, you know, as Christians, um it's there's nothing wrong with having an idea of your future or having plans and and uh, direction in your life. Um, but we always need to be have that flexibility that God's plan may differ from what, we, what, what our long-term plan is. Mm. And we need to have the flexibility to be able to, when God places that call in our heart, that we can respond. We're not so entrenched in our own desire to go where we want to go that we miss the call that God has put in our hearts. Yeah, yeah, that's quite a powerful thing because it's so easy to have your own ideals of what you want to do and be and achieve. I can personally resonate with that a lot. And God just says, no, this way. And you're like, oh, well, even <laughs> if to get used to that. <laughs> and, it, and it may not even be, you know, like my experience with, yeah. you know, with the ministry in Indonesia, mm. you know, we were doing, you know, God's work there, you yeah. know, and I really felt that. You know, this was the purpose that God had called us for, um, but God still had a different plan. And so sometimes it, we can be doing very good things and work for the kingdom, hmm. but God can redirect us and p- bring us somewhere else. He can change that. Yeah. Which is powerful to think about it like that, simply because oftentimes we think, oh, you know, if you're doing something that's that's not for the kingdom, of course God would call you away. Yes. You need to be willing to leave that. But what if... What if it's something that's perfectly good? And in your case, it's even prospering. And you think, you know, it's important for you to be here to just keep this going. And God says, no, come this way now. And I think one of the lessons from that is the fact that God's work doesn't rely on any particular person. Mm. Whether, whether I'm that, – that church is still flourishing today. Mm. And it didn't require any particular person to be there because – you know, it's it's, it's God's God. church. It's yeah. it, they're His people, and He will direct things as He sees fit. Yeah. And so, to be humble to, enough to realize that while God wants to use us wherever He places us, that may not be a long term placement. It can be a short term or a long term placement, mm. but it all depends on God's will. Mm. Yeah, I like how you put that because. It really changes the focus, doesn't it? And for everyone involved, it become you become acutely aware that it, it is all for God's glory. He is the one in charge here. It's up to him to do these things, and he's going to sustain it. That's right. Um, and that, as you say, is, can be really humbling. Um, but at the same time, I, I would say that that would give us a huge sense of peace because you know that you know it's not all. It's not up to us. That's right. You know, we're dependent on someone who is. Tremendous in power and wisdom, you know, far above the things of this world and human thoughts. And well, sometimes we lose sight. You know, we can be so vested in what we're doing, which mm. is which is good, but we we think to ourselves, or other people may even think that, oh, without this person involved, this whole ministry will fall apart. Yes, it all hinges around this person. Mm. 
but it, no ministry should ever hinge around One a person. Yeah. It only hinges around Christ. Mm. Yeah, and that's that's a model for sustainability, yeah, isn't it? Absolutely. For God's work. <laughs> yep. It's going to continue. The Lord lives forever. <laughs> it'll it'll go along as as long as He is. The ultimate in secession planning. Yes, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's that's a really good um, a really good thought to have in mind, and so so relevant, as you say, for everyone in ministry to um, just be mindful of that. That um, yeah, God is in control. Mm. Yeah. So thank you so much for sharing that, and um, yeah, such powerful lessons for us to take away. And thank you for sharing your journey. I think that it's um, very relevant. Uh, and we were talking before about this that um, you know everyone comes from different walks of life, and um, you might come from a person a uh, walk of life that's n- not even got any Christian upbringing but you may come from one that has got a real solid sincere hold on faith uh, which is what you had and yet mm. even in that situation God still works in a very individual way uh, to lead you on a journey to grow closer to him to grow to deeper understandings of truth mm. and um, and to just reveal more and more of what it means to follow him and surrender fully to him and and learn of him and so your story has very well reflected that and I know our listeners will resonate and so I really want to thank you for coming to share with us today and thank you also to our listeners for joining in on the program uh, by the word of their testimony and you know a testimony a person's testimony is truly evidence that God is real and that he's interested in us and that he cares about every aspect of our lives. So if you have a story that you uh, have experienced of what God has done for you, share it today with someone. Um, Not only will um, you be blessed sharing, they will be blessed hearing as well. And so until next time, I'm your host, Casey Verkerka, and um, may God bless you richly. You've been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio.